The Rattling Boy from Dublin, the first of six temperance gems by William McGonagall. Read for LibriVox.org by Fox in the Stars of ShiningHalf.com. I'm a rattling boy from Dublin town. I courted a girl called Biddy Brown. Her eyes, they were black as sloes. She had black hair and an aquiline nose. Quack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. Quack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. One night I met her with another lad. Says I, Biddy, I've caught you by dad. I never thought you were half so bad as to be going about with another lad. Quack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. Quack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. Says I, Biddy, this never will do. For tonight you've proved to me untrue. So do not make a hullabaloo. For I will bid farewell to you. Quack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. Quack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. Says Barney McGee, she is my lass, and the man that says no, he is an ass. So come away, and I'll give you a glass. Och, sure you can get another lass. Quack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. Quack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. Says I to the devil with your glass, you have taken from me my darling lass. And if you look angry or offer to frown with my darling Shalala, I'll knock you down. Quack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. Ho oh, whack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. Says Barney McGee, unto me. By the hokey, I love Biddy Brown, and before I'll give her up to thee, one or both of us will go down. Quack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. Quack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. So with my darling Shalala, I gave him a whack, which left him lying on his back. Saying botheration to you and Biddy Brown, for I'm the rattling boy from Dublin town. Quack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. Quack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. So a policeman chanced to come up at that time, and he asked me the cause of the shine. Says I, he threatened to knock me down when I challenged him for walking with my Biddy Brown. Quack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. Quack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. So the policeman took Barney McGee to jail, which made him a shout and bewail that ever he met with Biddy Brown, the greatest deceiver in Dublin town. Quack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. Quack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. So I bade farewell to Biddy Brown, the greatest jilter in Dublin town, because she proved untrue to me and was going about with Barney McGee. Recorded March twenty eighth, two thousand six. This recording is in the public domain. Quack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. Quack fal de da, fal de darly do. Quack fal de da, fal de darly. A tribute to Mr. Murphy and the Blue Ribbon Army, the second of six temperance gems by William McGonagall. Read for LibriVox.org by Fox in the Stars of ShiningHalf.com. All hail to Mr. Murphy! He is a hero brave that has crossed the mighty Atlantic wave. For what purpose? Let me pause and think. I answer to warn the people not to taste strong drink. And I'm sure if they take his advice, they never will rue 
the day they joined the Blue Ribbon Army in the year 1882. And I hope to their colors they will always prove true, and shout hurrah for Mr. Murphy and the Ribbon of Blue. What is strong drink, let me think? I answer, tis a thing from whence the majority of evils spring, and causes many a fireside with boisterous talk to ring, and leaves behind it a deadly sting. Some people do say it is good when taken in moderation, but when taken to excess it leads to tribulation, also to starvation and loss of reputation, likewise your eternal soul's damnation. The drunkard, he says he can't give it up, for I must confess temptations in the cup, but he wishes to God it was banished from the land while he holds the cup in his trembling hand. And he exclaims in the agony of his soul, O oh God, I cannot myself control from this most accursed cup. O oh, help me, God, to give it up. Strong drink to the body can do no good. It defiles the blood, likewise the food, and causes the drunkard with pain to groan, because it extracts the marrow from the bone, and hastens him on to a premature grave, because to the cup he is bound a slave. For the temptation is hard to thole, and by it he will lose his immortal soul. The more's the pity, I must say, that so many men and women are by it led astray, and decoyed from the paths of virtue, and led on to vice, by drinking too much alcohol, and acting unwise. Good people all, of every degree, I pray ye all be warned by me, I advise ye all to pause and think, and never more to taste strong drink. Because the drunkard shall never inherit the kingdom of God, and whosoever God loves he chastens with his rod. Therefore be warned and think in time, and don't drink any more whiskey, rum, or wine. But go at once, make no delay, and join the Blue Ribbon Army without dismay and rally round Mr. Murphy, and make a bold stand, and help to drive the bane of society from our land. I wish Mr. Murphy every success, hoping he will make rapid progress. And to the Blue Ribbon Army may he always prove true, and adhere to his colors, the beautiful blue. Recorded April 10th, 2006 this recording is in the public domain. The Destroying Angel, or The Poet's Dream The Third of Six Temperance Gems by William McGonagall Read for LibriVox.org by Fox in the Stars of ShiningHalf.com I dreamt a dream the other night that an angel appeared to me clothed in white. Oh, it was a beautiful sight, such as filled my heart with delight. And in her hand she held a flaming brand, which she waved above her head most grand. And on me she glared with love-beaming eyes. Then she commanded me from my bed to arise. And in a sweet voice she said, You must follow me, and in a short time you shall see the destruction of all the public houses in the city, which is, my friend, the God of Heaven's decree. Then from my bed in fear I arose, and quickly donned on my clothes, and when that was done she said, Follow me, direct to the high street, fearlessly. So with the beautiful angel away I did go, and when we arrived at the high street, oh, what a show! I suppose there were about five thousand men there, all vowing vengeance against the publicans, I do declare.
Then the angel cried with a solemn voice aloud to that vast and godly assembled crowd, Gentlemen belonging the fair city of Dundee, remember I have been sent here by God to warn ye that by God's decree ye must take up arms and follow me, and wreck all the public houses in this fair city, because God cannot countenance such dens of iniquity. Therefore, friends of God, come, follow me. Because God has said, there is no use preaching against strong drink, therefore, by taking up arms against it, God does think, that is the only and the effectual cure to banish it from the land. He is quite sure. Besides, it has been denounced in Dundee for fifty years by the friends of temperance, while oft they have shed tears. Therefore God thinks there is no use denouncing it any longer, because the more that's said against it, it seemingly grows stronger. And while the angel was thus addressing the people, the devil seemed to be standing on the town-house steeple, foaming at the mouth with rage and seemingly much annoyed, and kicking the steeple because the public houses were going to be destroyed. Then the angel cried, Satan, avaunt, be gone! Then he vanished in the flame, to the amazement of every one, and waving aloft the flaming brand that she carried in her right hand, she cried, Now, friends of the temperance cause, follow me, for remember, it's God's high decree to destroy all the public houses in this fair city. Therefore, friends of God, let's commence this war immediately. Then from the high street we all did retire, as the angel sent by God did desire. And along the Perth road we all did go, while the angel set fire to the public houses along that row. And when the Perth Road public houses were fired, she cried, Follow me! And next I'll fire the Hawkhill public houses instantly. Then away we went with the angel, without dread or woe, and she fired the Hawkhill public houses as onward we did go. Then she cried, Let's on to Scouring Burn in God's name! And away to the Scouring Burn we went with our hearts aflame, as the destroying angel did command. And when there she fired the public houses, which looked very grand. And when the public houses there were blazing like a kiln, she cried, Now, my friends, we'll march to the Bonnet Hill, and we'll fire the dens of iniquity without dismay. Therefore let's march on, my friends, without delay. And when we arrived at the Bonnet Hill, the angel fired the public houses as she did well, then she cried, We'll leave them now to their fate, and march on to the Murray Gate. Then we marched on to the Murray Gate, and the angel fired the public houses there, a most deserving fate. Then to the high street we marched and fired them there, which was a most beautiful blaze, I do declare. And on the high street old men and women gathered there, and as the flames ascended upwards, in amazement they did stare, when they saw the public houses in a blaze. But they clapped their hands with joy, and to God gave praise. Then the angel cried, Thank God, Christ's kingdom's near at hand, and there will soon be peace and plenty throughout the land, and the ravages of the demon drink no more will be seen. But alas, I started up in bed, and behold, it was a dream. Recorded May 22nd, 2006. This recording is in the public domain. The Troubles of Matthew Mahoney by William McGonagall Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Yearsley In a little town in Devonshire, in the mellow September moonlight, a gentleman passing along a street saw a pitiful sight a man bending over the form of a woman on the pavement. He was uttering plaintive words, and seemingly discontent. "'What's the matter with the woman?' asked the gentleman, as the poor fallen woman he did narrowly scan. "'There's something the matter, as your honour can see, but it's not right to prate about my wife. Blame me.' "'Is that really your wife?' said the gentleman. 
Yes, sir, but she looks very pale and wan. But surely she is much younger than you? Only fourteen years, sir, that is through. It's myself that looks a deal older, nor really I am. Trouble have whitened my hair, my good gentleman, which was once as black as the wings of a crow and it's throbble as is dyed it as white as the snow. Come, my dear soul, Bridget, it's past nine o'clock, and to see as lying there, it gives my heart a shock. And he smoothed away the raven hair from her forehead, and her hands hung heavily as if she had been dead. The gentleman saw what was the matter, and he sighed again, and he said, It's a great trial, and must give you pain, but I see you are willing to help her all you can but the encouraging words was not lost upon the Irishman. Trial, he echoed, don't mention it, your honour, but the blessings of God rest upon her. Poor creature, she's good bar in this one fault, and by any one I don't like to hear her miscalled. What was the reason of her taking to drink? Bless your honour, that's just what I often times think. Some things is done without any reason at all, and sure this one to me is a great downfall. Ah, Bridget, my darling, I never dreamt you'd come to this. And stooping down, her cheek he did kiss, while a glittering tear flashed in the moonlight to the ground, for the poor husband's grief was really profound. Have you any children? asked the gentleman. No, your honour, bless the Lord, contented I am. I wouldn't have the lambs know any harm of their mother. Besides, sir, to me they would be a great bother. What is your trade, my good man? Gardening, sir, and mighty fond of it I am. Kind sir, I am out of a job, and I am dying with sorrow. Well, you can call at my house by ten o'clock to-morrow, and I'll see what I can do for you. Now hasten home with your wife, and I bid you adieu. But stay, my good man, I did not ask your name. My name is Matthew Mahoney, after Father Matthew, of great fame. Then Mahoney stooped and lifted Bridget tenderly, and carried her home in his arms cheerfully, and put her to bed while he felt quite content, still hoping Bridget would see the folly of drinking, and repent. And at ten o'clock next morning, Matthew was at Blandford Hall, and politely for Mr. Gillespie he did call. But he was told Mrs. Gillespie he would see, and was invited into the parlour cheerfully. And when Mrs. Gillespie entered the room, she said, Matthew Mahoney, I suppose you want to know your doom. Well, Matthew, tell your wife to call here to-morrow. I'll ask her, my lady, for my heart's full of sorrow. So Matthew got his wife to make her appearance at Blandford Hall, and trembling upon Mrs. Gillespie, poor Bridget did call, and had a pleasant interview with Mrs. Gillespie, and was told she was wanted for a new lodgekeeper immediately. But, Bridget, my dear woman, you mustn't drink any more, for you have got a good husband you ought to adore. And Mr. Gillespie will help you, I'm sure, because he is very kind to deserving poor. And Bridget's repentance was hearty and sincere, and by the grace of God she never drank whisky, rum, or beer, and good thoughts come into her mind of heaven above, and Matthew Mahoney dearly does her love. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. The Demon Drink by William McGonagall Read for LibriVox.org by Alana Jordan O oh, thou demon drink, thou fell destroyer, thou curse of society, and its greatest annoyer. What hast thou done to society? Let me think. I answer thou hast caused the most of ills, thou demon drink. Thou causest the mother to neglect her child, also the father to act as he were wild, so that he neglects his loving wife and family dear by spending his earnings foolishly on whiskey, rum, and beer. And after spending his earnings, foolishly he beats his wife, that man that promised to protect her during life. And so the man would, if there was no drink in society, 
for a man seldom beats his wife in a state of sobriety. And if he does, perhaps he finds his wife foo. Then that causes no doubt a great hullabaloo. When he finds his wife drunk, he begins to frown, and in a fury of passion he knocks her down, and in that knockdown she fractures her head, and perhaps the poor wife she is killed dead. Whereas if there was no strong drink to be got, to be killed wouldn't have been the poor wife's lot. Then the unfortunate husband is arrested and cast into jail, and sadly his fate he does bewail, and he curses the hour that ever was born, and paces his cell up and down, very forlorn. And when the day of his trial draws near, no doubt for the murdering of his wife he drops a tear, and he exclaims, O oh, thou demon, drink through thee, I must die. And on the scaffold he warns the people from drink to fly, because whenever a father or mother takes to drink, step by step on in crime they do sink, until their children loses all affection for them, and in justice we cannot their children condemn. The man that gets drunk is little else than a fool, and is in the habit, no doubt, of advocating for home rule. But the best home rule for him, as far as I can understand, is the abolition of strong drink from the land. And the men that get drunk in general wants home rule, but such men, I rather think, should keep their heads cool, and try and learn more sense, I most earnestly do pray, and help to get strong drink abolished without delay. If drink was abolished, how many peaceful homes would there be? Just, for instance, in the beautiful town of Dundee, then this world would be heaven, whereas it's a hell and the people would have more peace in it to dwell. Alas, strong drink makes men and women fanatics, and helps to fill our prisons and lunatics. And if there was no strong drink, such cases wouldn't be, which would be a very glad sight for all Christians to see. Oh, admit, a man may be a very good man, but in my opinion, he cannot be a true Christian. As long as he partakes of strong drink, the more that he may differently think. But no matter what he thinks, I say nay. For by taking it, he helps to lead his brither astray. Whereas if he didn't drink, he would help to reform society, and we would soon do away with all inebriety. Then, for the sake of society and the church of God, let each one try to abolish it at home and abroad. Then poverty and crime would decrease and be at a stand and Christ's kingdom would soon be established throughout the land. Therefore, brothers and sisters, pause and think, and try to abolish the foul fiend drink. Let such doctrine be taught in church and school, that the abolition of strong drink is the only home rule. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A new temperance poem in memory of my departed parents who were sober living and God-fearing people. 
by William McGonagall, read for LibriVox.org, by Alana Jordan. My parents were sober living, and often did pray, for their family to abstain from intoxicating drink alway, because they knew it would lead them astray, which no God-fearing man will dare to gainsay. Some people do say that God made strong drink, but he is not so cruel, I think, to lay a stumbling block in his children's way and then punish them for going astray. No, God has more love for his children than mere man. To make strong drink their souls to damn. His love is more boundless than mere man's by far. And to say not, it would be an unequal par. A man that truly loves his family won't allow them to drink. Because he knows seldom about God they will think. Besides, he knows it will destroy their intellect and cause them to hold their parents in disrespect. Strong drink makes the people commit all sorts of evil and must have been made by the devil for to make them quarrel, murder, steal, and fight and prevent them from doing what is right. The devil delights in leading the people astray, so that he may fill his kingdom with them without delay. It is the greatest pleasure he can really find to be the enemy of all mankind. The devil delights in breeding family strife, especially betwixt man and wife. And if the husband comes home drunk at night, he laughs and cries, Ha, ha, what a beautiful sight. And if the husband asks his supper when he comes in, the poor wife must instantly find it for him. And if she cannot find it, he will curse and frown, and very likely knock his loving wife down. Then the children will scream aloud, and the devil no doubt will feel very proud. If he can get the children to leave their own fireside, and to tell their drunken father they won't with him reside, strong drink will cause the gambler to rob and kill his brother, I, also his father and his mother all for the sake of getting money to gamble, likewise to drink, cheat, and wrangle. And when the burglar wants to do his work very handy, he plies himself with a glass of whiskey, rum, or brandy, to give himself courage to rob and kill, an innocent people's blood to spill. Whereas if I couldn't get whiskey, rum, or brandy, he wouldn't do his work so handy. Therefore, in that respect, let strong drink be abolished in time, and that will cause a great decrease in crime. Therefore, for the sufficient reason, remove it from society for seldom burglary is committed in a state of sobriety. And I earnestly entreat ye all to join with heart and hand and to help chase away the demon drink from Bonnie Scotland. I beseech ye all to kneel down and pray and implore God to take it away. Then this world would be a heaven, whereas it is a hell. 
and the people would have more peace in it to dwell. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.